force map is actually fairly simple. <laughs> I'm sorry? Look at these two maps next to each other. Like, this looks so simple. <laughs> I forgot it how. It's pretty quaint. Mm hmm. That's Britannia. Oh, yes, we're live. Oops. Welcome to another edition of Classic Quest, a weekly playthrough of classic role-playing games of, I always, always want to say Golden Age, but I don't remember what the verdict was. Yeah, I, I don't have Matt Barton's book. He, uh, maybe this was the Silver, I don't know. Um, should be the Golden Age. What uh, Dr. Thomas Malaby will not be joining us today, unfortunately. Um, but we are going to basically start over based on some of the questions and discussion that we had last week about mapping and doing playing this game quote unquote properly. Right. And so I guess we're going to uh do it i guess much in the same way we i imagine we both did yeah <laughs> <laughs> back when we first played this game with uh much the same way that we played tabletop role playing games uh graph paper and notes and um no i think that's i think that's why one of these games were successful is that they at this time they were still simulate they were kind of moving away from simulations and becoming more virtual worlds and allowing the computer as a tool to handle some of the more tedious tasks of associated with game mastery i've never mastered a game <laughs> um, other than for my own two children which doesn't count because they have to kind of deal with it no matter what right what are some of the things that, you know, in your experience, DMing, would you be happily turn over to the computer and say, have at it? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I can answer that question, but I can say when I was, yeah, I mean, there's so much. I mean, from calendar keeping to, to timekeeping, there's so much mon mundane, I was going to say mundanity, which is not a word that would be great that a computer could take, um, you know, could take over. I, you know, these games, as an only child growing up, uh, I mean, I got into the, a lot of these games, although I was never particularly successful at Ultima Four Quest of the Avatar. I think one of the reasons why I'm actually excited for us to um, play it, as opposed to kind of just poke around with it and talk about it, is because uh, I never got particularly far in this game, despite the fact that I loved it. Um, I love these games because as a kid, Dungeons and Dragons in, you know, 1980, was not the easiest game to play because you usually had to find about five or six other folks that were willing to play it. Um, and the amount of work, especially at the age when D&D originally initially came out, the amount of work that it takes. I, I always I run, as you know, a few games at D&D currently, and I don't even know how... Uh, it's like I feel like D&D is only played... That I can only play... It, uh, correctly now as an adult because I finally kind of have the time to know yeah. exactly what I need mm -hmm. to do. Um, I mean, that doesn't take away from the fact that the campaigns that I played as a kid were unbelievably fun. But they were usually extremely unstructured. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that was promised in the rule book was never completely realized as a kid just because we didn't really initially know how mm -hmm. to kind of do that. Um, but I'm kind of getting off the topic. But these games, because I loved, I mean, I read, you know, as I still do, a lot of the D&D rule books absolutely just for fun as you might read fiction. And... It was always kind of frustrating that you couldn't play. So when you know the, when the computer role playing game came out and had access to some of these games, it was just fantastic. Because despite the fact that these games nowhere close, you know, completely recreate what it's like to play with a group of you know an actual group of Dungeons and Dragons, it kind of you know it, it gets as close as you can get. Um, in some ways, of course, it's it's better if you've there's a, I wish I could remember who the quotation is from. This is one great quotation. You know, if you play with a group of 
play Dungeons and Dragons, you're obviously playing with six, seven, eight people. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lot of input in, in the course of four hours. Mm -hmm. um, playing one of these games, of course, you're controlling the entire party, so it's a chance to be more involved. There was this quotation I was getting. I wish I could remember who said it once, but they said Dungeons and Dragons is like five hours of mind-numbing, you know, boredom <laughs> and 20 minutes of pure, utter joy, you know? And in many ways... Kind of like football. <laughs> yeah. Um, in many ways, I think that's kind of true. Um, well, uh, but I don't know if I'm answering your question no, at but that's all. a good point, though. I mean, one of the great things about a game like this, especially, and in, in subsequent games where you control an entire party, is that you don't... You, you, are, you have a... A commitment to the character that you create but the the folks that you pick up along the way you all you're also playing them and you're also able to do those make the act out those choices right. that you cut off by making that character um, and I think that's what's really fun about these part of the, the great thing about the character creation is not only the character that you end up with or the class but now you that is we figured out, or you mentioned last week, mm -hmm. it also determines who you have to go pick up. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, it's a little bit simple in Ultima 4. Each person kind of embodies one of the virtues, but I don't know. It um, doesn't get much more complicated than that in D&D &D or right. most role-playing games. So, Well, should we yeah, go dive for it. in? Yeah. Right, so are you sure you want me to... It's all you, yeah. Creation. I've I've done it three hundred times. I've um, I've made a tinker so many times. <laughs> but yeah, we're playing this exactly how you would play it in 1983, 84, When did this game come out? Eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. Um, without the Mountain Dew and the pizza, um, and sitting on the ninth floor of a college, but pretty much the same. So one of the things I would I since we're doing the maps and the notes and everything. Would you, maybe this is better suited for off camera, but whatever. How would you feel about us having a Google Drive or somewhere out there where it could be accessed? Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds good? Yep. All right, because um, I don't know. I It's strange that as, as I'm writing about virtual worlds, it's strange how much work there has been written about Ultima 4. Mm-hmm but so little that actually truly recognizes everything that goes into what Ultima 4 mm -hmm. and games like this are. Um, well, I think there's... I, you know, this is... I, again, we can... I mean, that's a, a great point. I can digress. I was thinking about that just... Well, I was thinking about in terms of the fact that because I am you know, come back to graduate school. I, I'm writing about games. I'm teaching about games this semester as well. And I'm absolutely playing nothing, right? I, I make this joke. I make this joke all the time that I have... So I've always wanted to play Dragon Age, right? Because it was made... I'm a Baldur's Gate fan, right? It's, it was the successor of Baldur's Gate. Well, Dragon Age came out in 2000... 10 years ago, I think, 2008. Wow, that long. Or two, 2009, actually. Mm -hmm. And I have been trying to play that game now for nine straight years. And I'm about 30% into the game. Um, and that's because I just have literally no time. Yeah. And games require so much time. And I'm always amazed that people have the time to do, to play games. To play games to the level where people are platinum. So I'm going off on a digression. I'm sorry. But to, to platinum, you know, trophy games, to, to put the hundreds of hours that you actually have to do is absolutely amazing to me. Now, the problem with that is, is, to, is, is I worry as I think some academic theorists, critics get, is that some of the depth that we're able to deal with games isn't surface deep necessarily, but it doesn't necessarily, but if, if we buy Ian Bogo's idea that a game's argument made is, it's made in its procedural rhetoric through the actual experience of the game, and we're writing about the game and we're watching somebody Twitch stream or, or we're watching the game just from you know thinking about what the code does, um, I don't know if that's enough, you know what I mean? No. Like. Um, <laughs> We can talk about, I mean, I can talk about Ultimate 4 all the time, because I did put 100 hours into this as a kid, because I had the time when I was 11 years old. But these days, I find it I'm sorry, I'm kind of digressing no, on your point, but um, it is interesting. You know, that 
I guess that's the question. Is there more? The, it's too bad Dr. Malaby's in here because I'm sure, considering his work about you know the processes of game work, um, you know how important is that? You know, can we understand a game just by watching twitching stream or just reading about it? I don't know if you necessarily can. Um, uh, some of the bits that I'm reading today, and I, I'm pretty sure this is Mark Wolf, but I'm not entirely, or maybe someone who cited him, but pointed out that games. Um, have always un been understood as these very expansive spaces that are almost impossible to completely explore. Hmm. And that's only, and that was written uh, in the early 90s, I think. So now we're talking about, you know, now we're really digressing. Spider Man comes out for the PlayStation 4, <laughs> and you, and there's no shortage of screenshots of people who are un are literally unturning stones yeah, yeah, yeah. in this game, finding out all the little Easter eggs and bits that the artists have thrown in there. And so they're taught, I mean, Grand Theft Auto's done this, uh, Witcher 3, mm -hmm. I mean, they all have these enormous maps that take an insane amount of time. So we're playing differently. And it's, if you're studying games, it becomes even more impossible and difficult for those of us in in graduate school, and not with they don't have the luxury of time. Yeah, and it becomes really frustrating to to sit here and go, well, I'm writing about this, but I don't have the ability, the capacity to even complete this right now. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, you could easily write an entire PhD dissertation on in almost any of these games um, if you were to talk about a, you know fully realized kind of virtual world and how they all. I I don't yeah. Spider-Man game is funny you mentioned that. Of course, I want to play that game so bad because all I'm doing is reading about those reviews. It sounds like a really yeah. good game. Well, um, yeah, maybe someday. Do you have a PlayStation? I do. Okay. I have. I bought the the same game I bought with the PlayStation on the day that I bought it. Has never been played uh, again because of time. Which was Assassin's Creed, the Black Flag one. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I've always liked those. Um, they're those are fun to watch they're, for me as, yeah, as a parent watching my kids play it. It's like. I really don't have any interest in doing this, but um, it sure is fun to watch. And I've actually, I know I'm really digressing. <laughs> I actually had a friend who um, was not into playing games, but he bought a console specifically to play one of those Assassin's Creed games uh, because he had gone to a lot of the places that were in. The, yeah. And he said it was just magical to be in such a, um, a realized representation of something that I of a place that I only visited and loved mm -hmm. and it's just like yeah it's... why do those games have to require us to be an assassin because I mean it, can't, couldn't we have a triple A industry where it's just a historical time tourism where you could I don't know that, that's always the thing that always gets me is like oh I have to assassinate somebody now after poking around you know well because then you get too many goofballs like us who go in there and say well whose representation is this <laughs> you know <laughs> What, whose history are you representing? I mean, uh, yeah. Um, I, I do a little bit about, I mean, one of my chapters is on virtual tourism and all that, and um, I don't really get into the problems, like, because you, it becomes an industry in itself, and then you, like, who's... Whose tour are we taking? And who, mm. what are what are we highlighting? What are we overlooking? And it becomes a mess. But well, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, should we tour Britannia? I had, yeah, we should probably. <laughs> this what is a question quest. Thank you very much. I did have something I was going to say. Damn oh, sorry. It. No, 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 no. It's no, it probably wasn't important at all. Uh, now I just want to back up my this. Tourism doesn't matter. All right, let's start. Uh, Becoming virtual tourists of Britannia, which has just been renamed Britannia from Caesarea. And unlike Assassin's Creed, where we're talking about virtual tourism through representation of the, uh, I guess, rather large staff that creates it, you, not Ubisoft? Who creates the company that does the Assassin's Creed's game? Anyway, my point... That sounds right. This is a virtual tourism of the imagination of Richard Garriott, which I think makes it kind of fascinating that we are diving into the adolescent imagination. Does he have a biography out there by any chance? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know much about him. Um, 
I would, again, I'm plugging one of my favorite websites, uh, Jimmy Maher's Digital Antiquarian. If you don't hang out there, viewers, you should. Um, he did a, he does a, 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 I wouldn't say a little more than brief, but like in a few blog posts, he talks about where Richard Garriott's from, because his father was a, an astronaut. Um, can't remember what his mother did, but you know, the original, I mean, there's a lot of interesting f facts in Digital Antiquarian. I like the fact that the first Ultima games were written like, basically on ticker tape, you know, that he had to feed into the computer. I mean, he was a prodigy, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no getting away from that. You know, he's gone to space, right, with the yeah. the money that he's made. Um, he has created two games, the most two contemporary games that he's created, of course, is Tabula Rasa, which was an MMO, which was a failure, and now Shroud of the Avatar, which sadly may be heading that direction as well. Hmm. Um, It'd be interesting to hear what he thinks of Ultima Online's longevity. And that whole, I mean, even the various iterations of Ultima Online, because it really... Um, I think it's gone in a lot of directions that they didn't necessarily want to go. Um, hmm. I don't, you know, I don't know the whole history. I mean, there's, there's a book in that as well. Because um, Ultima Online was fascinating. I, you know, my friend was a bigger fan of Ultima Online. I played because it was fun to play with him. And I love the idea of an online space, but the lack of quests or narrative always drove me absolutely crazy. You know, I, I don't know if I just it completely ignored them the first time I owned Ultima Online, but there are quests now. Yeah, I, <laughs> like, I haven't played the new version, but that's what I... And so, yeah, I, it, it's a weird space. I mean, we're, I, yeah, we're, this is, we can get into this later, but, you know, that's, those early uh, MMOs were, are fascinating, but um, they're just different. Uh, we're reaching, reading uh, Richard Bartle's Designing Virtual Worlds again this morning, and a bit, a bit about it, and it's a, his, he's really advocating from behind the developer's curtain as to what a game can be and he's saying it's not a simulation it's not a service he's writing from 2004 so most of these games have been out we've experimented with we've seen everquest we've seen ultima online all these things come and go all ostensibly stemming from mud one his right. creation right and so he's kind of it feels like he's this <laughs> i don't know maybe it's because you know the way bartle speaks or but you just see him like sitting on top of a horse riding back and forth <laughs> across the line of developers saying you know fending off the the forces of consumerism <laughs> and just like this is not a simulation this is not a service this this can be art but it's not art it's a place you know and, it, and it's a really lovely statement mm -hmm. but really all he's talking about is a set of locations which is a place is much more than that um, but anyway so I promise that's my last digression but anyway this game really for me evokes a sense of place more than almost any other game to this mm -hmm. day um, I, there is a good chunk of nostalgia. Um, interestingly, as I get older, the sense of community that comes with, is associated with place, uh, is certainly there. Um, you know, we both have met so many people just here at UWM who has some type of affinity for this, and it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Time to tinker. Initiate, initiate new game. Appshy? No. Oh. Um, I love how I actually have to that. How, how important a decision that is to me. Yeah, go for it. What's that? A P S H A I. And it's it's uh, yeah. I use this for every game that I play. It's a reference to Temple of Apshai, my favorite role-playing game of all time. And it's a long conversation on why that game is so amazing. Is there any reason why you always select that name? Um, because it's, it's just a reference to, okay. to that game. Uh, I mean, when you start playing, when you've played as many role-playing games and run as many games as you have, it's the idea of coming up with new names, and it seems to be associated with my identity. That's a very binary question. And doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I 
a female. I don't think that makes any difference in the game. Um, I'm going to write this stuff down. Actually. Yeah. the other option just that it was a male and female name and gender yeah. because what else is there right Richard <laughs> well it is 1985 yeah 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 it's a weird um, kind of quandary to be in when you are when you remember games and the con and you, you're kind of familiar with the context and while you don't want to be apologetic towards things like binary uh, gender options, there's. I also don't want to. I try to move away and hesitate from going. Yeah, but that was the time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't come up with a uh, a genuine response to that yet. Um, well, I think for uh, yeah, I guess I am going to be Richard Gere. I apologize for a twenty year old. Yeah. In nineteen eighty five, probably wasn't. Parts of our society, at least, have evolved. I like to think so. So, how do you feel about me just cruising through this stuff? Yeah, I'm just going to quickly read these. I, we talked about it a lot, a lot last week, but I do think it is interesting, again, to note, for those of you just tuning in, um, that we are playing ourselves here, that we are supposed to, the idea is that we are walking away from high-tech living um, into this freaking... And, and I kind of mentioned it... Um, last week but i really like the idea that we're going out into nature that represents this uh kind of transformative zone that's a portal between different worlds a little pagan ideas there it's interesting because he was the son of an astronaut and he was a tinkerer of sorts and a hacker and high <laughs> high tech was his domain right I, you know, um, again, sorry to keep coming back to Jimmy Marr, but I thought he made an excellent point in the blog post, which I read last week, which is the idea that in Ultima, uh, I think in opposition to some of the other games, of the course, the contemporaries here would, you know, be the Wizardry or Bard's Tale games, magic seems to have, uh, um, it seems like magic is kind of science, right? Like magic here isn't just the recitation of a few, um, you know, archaic terms, you actually have to have reagents and apply them, you know, here's this, you know, I have this book here that helps us figure out what reagents, I guess, for instance, Awaken, we have to blend two reagents carefully, although it doesn't, oh, it, which are garlic and ginseng. The idea being that in this world, it's still science, but it just, uh, it's just a different, uh, different rules of physics apply mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in Britannia. But it's not, you know, the magic of the unexplained magic. And there's this interesting tone of accessibility. And maybe I'm reaching here, and this is certainly not much more than a half-baked thought, but um, the thought that technology would be the portal to this natural realm and that, especially when it comes to magic and the components for your spells, they're, again, thinking to, uh, this isn't the case in Ultima 4, Ultima Online, they're literally laying around on the ground. What is laying around on the ground? The, the spell components. Oh, okay, yeah. So there's this, um, despite, you know, in contrast to technology, especially at this time, only the very select few. The son of a NASA astronaut has access to a computer. Yeah. Very few people. And that's the type of person that has access to a computer in the mid-80s. Right? right. Very few people had them. Um, so the thought to that a, a computer would give you access to the natural world is kind of interesting. And that's not... We see it in a Colossal Cave Adventure. We see it in Zork. We see it in all... Um, 
Well, it's just it's funny that you bring up Zork because I was actually just going to bring it up as you mentioned that, which is that you're talking about how few people own computers. And Zork, I was just writing about this for my game culture class. Zork was the top selling computer game from 1980 to 1984. It was the number one game for was that five years in a row, and that entire run at the end of it, and I, I think I have the number right, a total number of 372,000 copies were sold. <laughs> Right, and that's now. So in last year, 2017, Call of Duty World War II was the top seller, 20 million copies. You know, we live in a very, very, very different world, um, and I think <clears throat> I, I do think that speaks to as well that the people, the you know, the Venn diagram of the fans who are going to play Ultima Four probably overlap quite a f bit with a lot of people playing Dungeons and Dragons at mm -hmm. the same time. So how much does this, how much of this game? requires us to know the lexicon of levels and experience and those things. I'm digressing. I, your point about the nature thing, I think, is well taken. <clears throat> no, but that's... I mean, but it's worth thinking about because there's... I mean, it's not really a digression because there's... Just those the comparison of those two numbers alone signifies how much... I mean, when you think of it that way, there's really no surprise that a game like Grand Theft Auto has made more money than almost all movies and books right. combined. I mean, it is... These are inhabitable... I mean, almost full-time at this point, given the streaming... Uh, thing. <laughs> I mean, people are actually making a living inhabiting these worlds full-time. Well, if you, you mentioned that, and the first thing I think about is Ultima Online, which I think was one of them, along with Ever, I think EverQuest, well, Ultima Online it did it first, yeah. was, I, and I remember when my friend Greg and I were first playing Ultima Online, and instantly, the accounts that were up for sale on eBay, yep. right? Yep. Um, that you can, you know, he and I were working at the same place at the time, we were for a non-profit together, and I remember us sitting down looking at our like, current salaries at a non-profit and being like, we could just walk out of here and start making characters for Ulta Online, basically probably about triple our salary. Um, <clears throat> of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Because well, Why doesn't it exist anymore? I know World of Warcraft like, put an end to that as well. Yeah, well, uh, I would be willing to... Well, there's, it's just changed. Um, I think I heard an NPR story not too long ago about Fortnite coaches. And if you are so invested in your child's ability to play Fortnite, you can hire a coach to teach them. So maybe that's maybe giving up the graduate student life and coaching a twine. I have never played Fortnite or player on Battlegrounds. I confess I have. Yes, yeah. And I confess I um, I recently had to just say, you know what, I'm just not going to do this anymore. Is it fun? Oh yeah. You know, um I've had these conversations a lot, so forgive me if I've uh, inundated you with this already, but there's a there's that question of games and fun. I mean, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we, we talked about it last okay, week. We yeah. talked about the idea of fun being kind of a hard concept. To... Fortnite is fun. Don't, I mean, it is, but it, it is also frustrating. It is, all, you know, uh, but that's, it's the most fun game I've played in a while, and but at the same time, it's also not enjoyable. I don't. I don't know how to describe it. There's a. You don't feel like you've moved, like you've done anything at the end of it. No, that's not the, what. It, that's not what it does. Yeah. Well, there's a. Yeah, especially it's one of those things that, as if you study games, there are going to be those works that you're just never going to be happy with because you can't stop critiquing, mm -hmm. and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. There's just too many things I just don't, by nature like about it the the performance the pay, not pay to win but pay to demonstrate your ability that kind of stuff bothers me um i don't know if there are other things that i haven't i don't even want to bother articulating i've been uh yeah, we, talk about it. We, i've been debating assigning it for my class uh for two reasons one because it's such a big game right now and yeah. two because it would force me to actually play it to know what this thing is all right. I, I think it's worth looking at. I yeah. I just it got to the point. I'll, I'll be honest. I I, w I enjoyed it too. One of the reasons I enjoyed playing it with my younger son, 
And at the same time, my younger son does not like playing it with me. <laughs> <laughs> he would get so angry with me because I'm so bad at it. I just don't have the reflexes to play those games. Mm. And um, so for me, like I do a lot of exploring and a lot of doing other things. And, and so when it actually comes time to do what you're supposed to do in the right. game, I'm just, I'm just terrible at it. And he'd get mad at me. So I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. Anywho... So yeah, Fortnite. <laughs> My kids aren't going to know about anything other than the Apple II computer until they're 13 years old. I'm going to somehow convince them that technology stopped. <laughs> Buzz of dragonflies on the whisper of the willow swing branches bring in deep peace. Searching inward for tranquility and happiness, you close your eyes. And if we had this hand, it goes... Rrr! I... I'm not going to go too far into it, but I, th I think about this particular scene a lot because the whole portal and the computer as a portal. I think we talked about this again last week, but reading more into it. And um, this is not, anthropology is not my arena. Um, so if there are any of our anthropologist folks listening, I apologize, but like reading a lot of, Turner and Turner and I think it's Van Gennep so these works on rites of passage and pilgrimage there's these uh, transition rites where the portal and the doorway is something that's very important uh, for cultures who celebrate the transition from one place to another or one uh, status to another like uh, adulthood, you mm -hmm. know, rise to adulthood, that type of thing. It's, um, it's hard to look at doorways any, the same way. I keep going back to the. I mean, I keep thinking in terms of, well, I, I have so much to say about that. I mean, the, the idea, the idea that it's a literal portal in the game that you're moving to, right, makes the the literal the idea that we are actually moving into. There's an actual doorway in this game, right, where most games, you know, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't actually say, okay, we are going to move into, we are actually moving this avatar, which is supposed to. You're not an avatar yet. Technically, we are still role playing ourselves in this strange little kind of. 256 color little realm like that and now we move through the portal and now we're going to take on the idea of an avatar and become something different um, I, st I, I keep thinking just the Shakespearean idea that you move into the forest something crazy happens it's a complete different world and then you come back being changed mm -hmm. you know these games don't and I don't know if this is true or not since I've never reached the end of Ultima 4 or any Ultima game um, whether you actually return to yourself at the end of the game I think that would be interesting to know. I oh, don't think we have a lot of viewers. I wish we. I wish somebody could answer that question. Whether at the end of any of these games it says, "Ah, you've become the perfect avatar now. You head home," or even not. I now I have to finish this. Um, <laughs> like I've got this conclusion in my head about, um, and my advisor suggested this is, you know, talk about nothing but endings mm -hmm. in the conclusion and. Because uh, I'm talking about pilgrimages, and there's always the return home. Well, what happens after you get back? Um, after you come back from this, these, ex you know, playing a game, how is how is your outlook different? Yeah, this is <clears throat> to, that's that's really interesting, and now I want to know the end as well. Um, but I refuse to cheat because this game is so damned important. So, one of the things that there's a talk about a digression. One of the things that always I Chronicles of Narnia are some of my favorite fantasy books of all time. Hmm. Um, I'm rereading. I bought them for my son and, and their sons, and I'm rereading them again. And it's amazing how quickly you can fly through them. Uh, they seem to be much longer and denser when I was a kid. <laughs> um, but one of the, the thing that struck me as a kid, I've never forgotten this. It has always stayed with me because I thought it was such a strange narrative element. At the end of the first book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. So all of the uh, Edmund, was it Susan, Edmund, Susan, Peter. Lisa? It's not Lisa. I can't remember the other, the other girl. At any rate, at the end of their adventures, they, they become kings and queens of Narnia, right? They're adult kings and queens. They actually rule over Narnia for like 30, 30, 30 years or so. Okay. And at the end of it, they're wandering past the same lamppost that they originally walked into Narnia, and instantly, they go back to being children, 
uh, hmm. at the same age as when they left. And then they lived their own lives in this reality, right? That always struck me, even as a kid, as just incredibly bizarre that they had lived to middle age in this other realm and suddenly we're going to go on as kids. And how would that would be completely different as children? It's a digression. Mm. But how does it change you, this journey into, I mean, it's the same thing. And But we don't even know if we return at the end of Ultima 4, which I think is the interesting question. Yeah. And does the game make any mention of how the original person might be changed? Yeah, but the game ends, right? And all, all of these games end. And I think, you know, one of, one of my own core arguments is that what do we do when we're just bombarded and inundated by games and game-like structures? I mean, how are we? we're always questing, um, always returning, and <laughs> less and less satisfied. With the results, I wish I could. I wish I had my. I mean, if we really want to go an existential digression, I was thinking about this the other day about the relationship between fiction and reality. Uh, I come from a. <laughs> I come from a very bio. Have you ever heard the term biocentrism? Mm -mm. Um, biocentrism is is it's I I don't know it's kind of a hackneyed philosophy that I tend to agree with, which is the idea and. It, kind of based off some ideas of quantum physics, the idea that we are all collaborating on creating reality around us, right? Mm -hmm. That's the basis mm -hmm. idea. But it's called biocentric because it means instead of trying to explore space, why don't you try to explore whatever it is that our consciousness, because that's actually what's creating the world. Like space doesn't even exist until we make everything around us. That's the quickest way I can explain it. But I th was thinking about this in Dr. Malady's class <laughs> last week, and I can't remember why. But I was thinking about the difference. Um, we're reading Irving Goffman's... Um, presentation of self in everyday life and I think I was thinking in terms of how people view the world on a personal basis if the idea is that we're all collaborating to create this world together this the this, this space that we're all inhabiting fiction I find interesting because it seems as if this is the only way for us to look at worlds that are created by only one conscience mm -hmm. um, which is why this if this world is just a creation of ourselves it makes sense if we're all collaborating constantly why it seems to be developed so well and we talked about spider-man and uncovering every like rock it some seems to be something that we could do in this world because we're all constantly creating it there's so many minds working on us but you know the smaller the world the smaller person working on it maybe the less time the more worlds become disjointed uh, incomplete fragmented you're and talking you can't, about the outside world yeah well i'm saying yeah i'm saying these worlds like ultimate like we can't do everything we can do in the outside world because it's yeah. the work of just one mind right yeah. and that's what i think is interesting about fiction in some ways i don't know where i'm going with that but i was thinking about if the reality is one giant fiction that we're creating but books texts or a game like this are just smaller snippets of what it would look like when we just say what is what would what could one mind create I'm working on that well, uh, perspective. That's why, <laughs> that's why we turn to games, though. That's why they're so compelling, because they are easier. They're easier <clears throat> for us to deal with. Let's get, yeah, I mean, why, why do we turn over every single stone? Why do we go to visit every single storefront in Spider-Man when we have such a wealth of possibilities to explore in because, the real world? Because that's scary shit out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we've gotten to the... I mean, and I'm not... That's that's the perspective, though, right? Especially for those of us living in... Oh, well, anywhere anymore. But we're so inundated by fear and fear-mongering that it becomes uh, a trial just to walk out your door. And for, you know, you have children, I have children, then you have fearing for your own. Right, right. And you have this, so... So you have this great people are kids are no longer playing on playgrounds. Mm -hmm. They're playing on games and we're we're embracing that change because it's it's safer. But why would somebody and I do, I mean I'm guilty of this as well. I I agree, I don't disagree with that. I mean I think that's the reason why we don't suddenly jet off to Egypt to like go to the pyramids <laughs> as far as like playing Assassin's Creed, what's the origins or whatever, right? Like that makes sense. It's and it's easier and a lot less expensive to just pick up a fifty dollar copy of Assassin's Creed. But at the same time you think about people that will go to extreme lengths to read the lore of video games, whether it's... Think about how many World of Warcraft books there are. I mean, there's mm -hmm. literally a book for almost every character in that thing. Um, but I, mean, I guess my point is we can still explore this world. I mean, the lore of this world is rich and the amount of cultures. Um, but I think in some ways, maybe it's, you know, it's almost... It's extremely complex in some ways. Like, um, you know, you don't have the... 
obviously the lore of this world isn't necessarily written to entertain mm-hmm. um, you know as much as the story of Arthas is what we've got a beginning <laughs> and an end to it I don't know it's something that I think about all the time it's something I think yeah. about when I, when I feel guilty for playing well, like Moral is my favorite games and I do mm. like reading about the lore in those things and I yeah. will spend a lot of time reading the books in that game and I think it's fascinating and then I always find myself thinking well you know you read a history textbook or something be like the, the richness of our actual of our real world whatever you want to call it is in many ways vaster and deeper and yet I don't find myself pouring over medieval texts I do have friends who play D&D who do pour over medieval texts like yeah. that and adopted to the games so I think the game that we're in um, I think Chuck does that to some degree as well using history as a influence on the game yeah I mean there I've really enjoyed the couple sessions of the of doctors and DMs I believe we're gonna be chatting tomorrow at 5 p.m. but I'm really looking forward I've never experienced the Dragonlance portion of uh, D&D and I one of the things that I find so uh, compelling about it is that lore especially the theology of that mm-hmm. world I'm, I'm sure D and I remember de- de- deities and demigods, but it's much that's a much shallower to me representation of a cosmology and a theology. And there are problems. There are I mean there are loads of problems. I do not want to get into um, how like I'm reading reading the Dragonlance <laughs> and going oh no that's that's just awful. But, <laughs> But whatever. I mean, it's it's an attempt and whatever. I, I think, I mean, what, I'm sorry, what religion out there cannot say, cannot claim perfection. I don't know, whatever. Uh, anywho, well, they're, these worlds tend, they're, they're more, I think we're able to comprehend them a lot, so much easier. And we're not, games, game playing as a subculture is something that is only now becoming acceptable because the world are the worlds of fiction more more inviting and more interesting because they're more accessible i mean like trying to understand the nuance or the and and by the way this half of my thoughts here are extremely unformed because i never really thought this stuff out loud um but i was just thinking about you know the limits of fiction because they tend to be um the product of, of one imagination. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. But are they accessible because they're bite-sized pieces of the world? Like mm-hmm. all of these references, whether it's, it's Britannia, you know, an imagination is, doesn't, isn't so intimidating because it is, it is incomplete and fragmented at some level. It's not, like, would it be terrifying? Will it be terrifying if somebody created a simulation? Of course it would. Somebody created a simulation that was as complete as our reality. No, I mean, so that's why you have. Wait, we could be living in I don't know world. whose simulation, who are the simulation theorists, but the. <laughs> I'm going to take it on the authority of one of my undergraduate students from uh, last year. Um, you know, this. There's a growing body of work on, well, what if we are just living in a yeah, simulation? Yeah, yeah, Is it really that hard to fathom considering that? But it, it, I think one of the things, reasons that game fiction and fictions are so much more compelling is that they are intersubjective. They are, commu- they are collaborative. Even a game like this, where it's coming from the mind of Richard Garriott, there's still, especially anymore, with forums, as long as there's been an online space to discuss things, or even an offline space to discuss things, these have been collaborative. Mm-hmm. And they come from collaborative narrative building. And I think that's why, one of the reasons they're so compelling, not only are the, the fictions that we, have li- that we live through, the everyday, work hard, you'll be successful, do you know all these other atomic age things that are kind of falling to the wayside now? The good versus evil, that type of stuff. So I mean, again, so we're saying maybe games represent you know safer places because we can understand the underlying mechanics of it as well. Well, because they're narratives that we that we have some semblance of control over, and even if we're reading Tolkien, I can still go to you and say. Um, how about playing an RPG based on the Tolkien world and let's take it our own direction, right? Yeah, right. I mean, that's... We can't... 
it's almost a, like a subcultural entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta hate that. Uh, but it is. You're like, if you're in a culture that embraces the self-made person, pulling up by your bootstraps and uh, lording over the dominion that you oversee. We just don't have access to that anymore. Who can, I mean, very few people. You have to be born into that world to have access to that world. That's my So you're sense. saying there's more agency in these games than we have in our, in our real life? We like to think so, yeah. You know, you, you can't really, it becomes difficult because how much agency do you really have in the game? Right. That's what, and that goes back to this, goes back to play versus game. I think when we're playing, like if I'm playing ultim, uh, choosing my words carefully here, working through Ultima Four is very different from going out with my friends afterwards and playing Ultima Four in a playground or in the fields. Um, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you have a you're you know, you're playing Dungeons and Dragons and then you're still playing it out in the field, like LARPing. Mm -hmm. You know, before I even knew what LARPing was. Um, you know, I, I I want to haphazardly risk a turn to Orsit's ergodic literature. I mean I still I think that's one of the the a great way of looking at games as texts that we have to work through. I think I've begun every major paper that I've written um, questioning that idea, which is unfair to him because the whole book goes more into detail with that. But I've always, I, my point has always been, yeah, I, I, I yeah, the, I don't disagree. Um, fin I, I always bring up the point, like reading Finnegan's Wake or watching Mar Bergman's Persona, to use a film example, is just as hard to parse. In fact, it's harder to parse than necessarily completing most games these days, mm -hmm. you know? That idea of non-trivial effort to traverse a text, I've always found a little bit of issue with, and I'm not trying to pick on Orsett at all, uh, especially since he's kind of foundational to this thought. Although now I'm glad that <laughs> we brought that up because it, I just wrote about that exact same <laughs> quotation in my game culture lecture this week, so now I can make my students watch this. Um, and that's a really, that non-trivial, and I know he explains it, something about turning pages, and I, that's never been really clear to me. Uh, I don't, I couldn't give you a clear definition of what non-trivial and trivial. And that's what I'm saying, is like he does go into more detail in that. Yeah. Uh, the term nomadic comes up, and suddenly yeah. I realize I can't remember what the hell that word, word actually means. Um, so I always feel, I was kind of making a joke, because I always kind of pick on that I, the expression in almost all the papers that I tend to write. And yet, I'm still using the term throughout sure. my paper that it's a piece of ergodic text. Um, well, procedural rhetoric, for crying out loud. You, you bring that up at most conferences, and you get <laughs> from the audience but my god if you don't say it right <laughs> you don't it, I think that's just the problem of being a graduate student so so this game is uh, we've heard that this game can take you up to 100 hours and we have already spent one hour on the second screen already so this at this rate we will finish this game in 900 years and I, I, I almost feel like this should be a disclosure for this show because <laughs> it, it, it became apparent last semester that one of the things about a critical approach to games is that you can spend time on one or two screens. I swear that opening screen you could spend and uh, time about diegetic, non-diegetic spaces and all this other good stuff. Um, I mean, there's a reason why these games are important. But. By the way, I mentioned that I had something to say like mm -hmm. 20 minutes ago and totally forgot, and I wanted to bring it up again um, for no reason that I can't let anything be incomplete um we were talking about virtual tourism and i cannot remember the name of the actual work or the name of the author and i apologize because he's uh this is a really fascinating work but there was a piece of interactive fiction that was created and it's about the world's fair and i want to say 1848 but that could be wrong and we were talking about the idea and actually this is a segue to what i was just talking about how scary would it be if we created simulations that really were the real world um 
which is just kind of a crazy topic. And at some point, if we can make a simulation of that, but if you could know that you were your avatar, nothing would actually hurt you. How would it change your relationship to it? Bigger, larger questions. But I wanted to bring up this interactive fiction, and I think it's called World's Fair 1848. And I don't remember the author, but it was actually sold. He sold it, tried to do a little commercial work on Amazon and a few places. And the reason that it's such a fascinating work of IF, and to be fair, I have not played it, but I want I want to pick up the commercial copy that he created, and I want to say he's an academic or a real writer was to actually, as much as he could, simu simulate, that's a bad word to use, but as close to he could come and just using text as a text, it is a text adventure interactive fiction piece, what it would be like to be at this World's Fair. So I think he, he had maps of the World's Fair, you know, at each of the exhibits. What would it be like to see each exhibit? I think there's a time, again, I haven't played it, so I'm not the expert on this, but that was his original intention, was to try to create, <clears throat> you know, this... Uh, a, piece, a work of tourism, kind of like Assassin's Creed, and, and thankfully, of course, you don't have to go out and kill people in it. But you are still solving. There's still some riddle that's happening throughout the the work. That's cool. I and it's a recent. Uh, no, it's like oh, I want to say it's about 15, 15, 15 oh, okay. years old. Um, and I think it's like the only piece of IF that I think he's done. Um, but he's in the again. If you, is it? If, have you seen, you've seen Get Lamp, the documentary by Jason Scott? Mm -mm. Such a great documentary. What is it called? Get Lamp, uh, the documentary about text adventures. He is interviewed in that, and they mention it as well. G-E-T, Lamp? Yeah, Get Lamp. It's the you know one of the first commands in Colossal Cave Adventure. I don't know. I'm a big interactive fiction fan, so... Um, it's And by the way, it's, it's for free. You can watch it for free on YouTube, the Get cool. Lamp documentary. Um, although, if you purchase it, it comes in a really cool case. Nice. And what, like a lantern? I wish, although there's a lantern in every scene of the documentary. All right, so where are we? It is difficult to look at the blueness. <laughs> and this is like a, your, old, your old screens for your Commodore 64 would have something like, like a blue, that, that, oh, garish blue. The sound waves become so intense, they appear to become visible. Let's get that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Ooh, you said semicolonal. All set? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Rebirth. That's 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 another interesting one. There's so many academic scenes in this sequence. That I... <laughs> Do you have any history about Kyle the Younger? To the Googles. Be surprised if that was somebody that he played Dungeons and Dragons with. Yeah, almost I'm sibling, yeah. almost literally a younger sibling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I wonder why this is a historical question more than than an analytic question. But what was it if the contemporaries for Ultima Four are the Bard's Tale and the Wizardry games? Those are games that don't come with a lot of... I mean, there's certainly a lore and there's certainly a world around them. Um, I, I haven't really played much beyond the first Wizardry, which doesn't have a lot of lore. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it, it's all an excuse to try to, you know, to get into the dungeon and what are you fighting. Here... Um, 
So probably the example is to see how did the other games evolve. This is the fourth game, the Ultima series. The fourth game, the Bard's Tale series, is, is, is expected next month. Um, but I mean, the first three games, boy, the third game is, is, a, is a strange lore. You actually go back in time and fight Nazis. I, I'm, I'm digressing right now, but my point was... This wasn't required, I think, to make a commercially successful game, to make a history book, to make one book that just lists the different reagents, mm -hmm. um, to, to include a map, to include, you know, an onk. Um, that makes this game, I think, more memorable to us. I think it's why we don't forget it, because we do, we did, you know, we do view it as, like, this kind of world that we we're thinking about, where I don't think people are going to wax poetic necessarily about Wars of Dream and Bard's Tale, which seem to exist very firmly as games. Uh, my question was just, I wonder why Richard Garriott did this. Because it's try, cool. Try this out. Uh, Richard Garriott is, is an aspiring writer of questionable quality. <laughs> I mean, you, you have more creative writing chops than I do, and um, I'm, I look at Garriott's stuff and just kind of like, it's, it's adorable. <laughs> um, and it's like how I would write. Right, you yeah. know, if I were... Um, anyway. One of the things that, as trained writers, though, we've learned how to write, uh, throw things away. <laughs> 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 so maybe... Maybe the history of Britannia and the uh, spell book and all these other items are just bits and pieces that, well, and why would you? I mean, th that's all good stuff. It all adds to the lore. Um, and because it also extends the world on screen beyond... Well, I think it so extends the interest in this game. I mean, I think it's why we can talk about it. And I think, you know, we, we, could, we could sit here and I think... It, I don't know. The simulationist perspective versus... I mean, it's in the game as well, right? The idea of an entire, you know... Because we have wizardry and bard's tale in this game, not to the necessarily the same level of sophistication, but halfway through the game, it does shift from an overland adventure into dungeon crawling. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that portion probably about 2074. <laughs> um, but that's not the focus. Garriott set out to make a to make a world and even from looking at this opening sequence you can tell that the world on screen was not enough he wanted you to come away and that's why this this ending better be freaking good <laughs> because you know he wants you to come away not only experiencing the world that he was passionate about but looking at the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now those, so the paratextual bits, the spell book and the history and the map are all ways of extending the pursuit of virtue that he was after in Ultima 4 and all the other games, mm -hmm. but much more so in Ultima 4. Wanted you to go out. And so these are other more portals. If you have these in the real world, they're anchors into... Oh, I like that. It's a little deep. Give me my, my hip waders. I'm getting a little soiled here, but but they are. I mean, what's in what is interesting to me about the whole Ultima series is that it, I mean, at least from my interpretation of the histories, is that Ultima Four and Ultima Online were the the milestones for for Garriott's initial vision. I think you have to include. I um. I agree. I think you have to include Ultima Seven in that as well. Okay, I'm not familiar yeah. with Seven at all. So, what's why is Seven? Well, Ultima Seven was so I've never played Ultima Seven. Oh, I've been okay. looking forward to playing it for a long time, but again, my time troubles. <laughs> um, so the 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 one the Ultima games that are always pulled apart as being kind of revelatory. Ultima 4, here's a game where we're not trying to kill any big baddie at the end, we're trying to actually improve our characteristics, something that has, as far as we're aware of, at least at the AAA commercial level, never really even been attempted again. And we have followed the kill the bad guy at the end of the game ad nauseum now into 2018. Um, I mean, it's... 
I think in literally every RPG that I that I play to this day. You know, sometimes just trying to uncover who the final baddie is. Anyway, <laughs> Ultima, Ultima Online, of course, because it was one of the first MMOs and it took this world. But Ultima Online, graphically, mechanically, and process is very much based on Ultima Seven, which the idea okay. is very, very simulationist. The idea was you can touch literally everything in. In the game, you can cook anything. Well, you can't cook anything. You can't put a person on the on the spit. But you can cook all the food that you see in the game. You can, I think, you can make paper. Um, and you know, it inspired much of the crafting oh, systems in Ultima Online. And people rave about Ultima Seven. And I think it had a couple of, I think we call them expansions now, but um, they were like add-ons to the initial game. Because um, I think there was originally Ultima Seven, like Black Gate, and the I can't remember what the other ones are. Um, anybody who's played them would probably know. And that, you know, I think I think Richard Richard Garriott, uh, he wrote something called "What the Ultimate RPG Would Be." Have you seen that? Mm-mm. It's a document that he made, and you can find it on the Shroud of the Avatar website. Oh, cool. And it's interesting, and it, it it I should we should I should read it again before I come to the next one of these because I think it, it'll inform some of our thinking when we start doing the pontificating about what what Gary I was thinking but it, it talks about what he thinks the perfect computer RPG would be right and one of those things is you could touch every item that you could play with everything and I always find that extremely bizarre because that's I don't find that necessary at all um, you know we have Richard Gary and I have very different ideas about what would make a great RPG yeah. at the same time I still find it kind of fascinating um, I mean, I don't, you know, you're playing Ultima Online now. I mean, I remember playing Ultima Online for the first time, and the level of crafting in that game was really my first introduction to crafting at any game that I can remember. And it's such an unbelievable pain in the original <laughs> Ultima Online. You could go to, I mean, I can remember, I mean, geez, took in, taking out half of the the fauna in, uh, in you know, the shard that I was playing on just to find one deer steak, you know. <laughs> um, you could chip away at a mountain for hours to yeah. get one piece of ore. Uh, that's a digression. But um, Ultima 7 was where he pioneered that simulation aspect where everything could be interacted with in some way. But there's... Uh, yeah. I, I guess I don't want to go down that. I mean, it's it, it, interesting in seeing that. I am not a terrible fan of crafting games, uh, though I've played more than my share of Minecraft. Um, <laughs> it. What is a person's share of Minecraft? Um, <laughs> too many hours. Yeah. Too many hours. Uh, well, well, I get. Let's put it this way: when you start investing your own resources in <laughs> Minecraft servers, then you're in trouble, I guess. Um, I actually, my first game-related presentation at a conference was on Minecraft and. Uh, ecological representations in Minecraft and um, someone called out that I was completely wrong <laughs> and, and, and it was true um, but I was a kid of my late 30s <laughs> <laughs> anyway so coddly hungry yeah goodbye um But people in Ultima Online, you know, we knew I, I mean, when I was playing it, um, there are quite a few people who would play characters that would be very different than these avatars that were playing as a, a heroic character on the floor. I know people who did just craft. That was the only thing they yeah. did in Ultima. I, mean, sell to, well, I think you, it, it was always kind of, it made a lot of sense to have two characters, one that crafted yeah. items for your other character, which I didn't have enough time to do both of those things. I was on a, um, I'm actually looking at the Atlantic Shard discord server occasionally and there was someone there are an enormous amount of people in the same boat i am coming back to it years later who are just going like i i don't want to admit that i don't have a grasp on this anymore because it's so familiar but what the heck am i doing and i was just reading this little bit where the guy was saying this is how i make money you want to know why people give you money so readily in, in Ultima Online? It's because we've got tens, if not hundreds of millions to spare because they have multiple characters. Hmm. And they have the... But that's... I got to suspect that that also goes back to my argument that we have access. I can be a merchant. I can be a wealthy citizen mm-hmm. in a world of Ultima Online. I have 
no chance in hell of doing it in the United States of America. And also, the way to do it is, you know, you can follow a, a series of steps, which are kind of easy to follow, right? If you wanted to do something like that, it seemed, at least for somebody like me who's extreme, extremely linear thinker, um, almost overwhelming to do something that I don't know how to do. But in the mm-hmm. game, you're like, well, th- anyway, cool. And those, especially mechanics for- and processes that are evident i don't know yeah and if you're a narrative thinker would you be less prone to doing something that doesn't contribute to a narrative in a game Mm -hmm. and it's just to accumulate in-game wealth right and status it's a weird kind of but i mean it's a narrative in itself but it's probably if if you are into that is that the narrative that most makes sense to you work hard I mean, grind away, accumulate wealth. And I think even in this Discord server, the person is, you know, I feel like it's my job to help others at this point. Mm-hmm. I've done enough. So, you see, I, I think that's really fascinating. Because I, I, I see it a lot in... I play the Fallout games and would wonder the same stuff. Like, why in the world is this interactive? You know, there's the, the running joke about all of Bethesda's games. Like, oh, I've got this house full of, like, apples and mm-hmm. bottle, empty bottles and because I can't leave anything alone. <laughs> <laughs> because that is part, you know, uh, I'm going to throw the I word out there. Is that part of immersion, right. though? Does that help make it seem like the world is real if you can knock a mop bucket over? <laughs> <laughs> and to Richard Garriott, I think his answer would be yes. The tongue of the title is beyond your ken. And that then, needs to be on a t-shirt. And it's this book, right? The spell so book? I think, yeah, I think that's the one. I think this is the one that was scary. Yeah. That is beyond my ken. Next next time, I'm going to get images again of all the Ultima 4 PDFs. You read the Book of History. Yeah. And this is... Oh, so it's that one. And, no, so there's two books that you found. Oh, okay. This is the one that's not scaring us as much. Okay. I don't really read it. I love that. Yeah. But I love manuals, too. I mean, we talked about how we love extra materials. Wasteland, the game Wasteland, which was originally made by Interplay came with a huge book where we had to go and look up and we would play the game and it's it's a well wasteland in some ways is a half step between ultima and bard's tale I mean, it's made by the mm. folks that made bard's tale but it has an adventuring component um actually i don't think it has dungeons you're so it doesn't really interesting you should take a look at wasteland wasteland sometime. um have you ever played that nope you would love it as a kid um, and of course, the sequel was released as a Kickstarter just a couple of a few years ago. A friend of mine actually paid a thousand dollars to have his likeness put in the game as one of the NPCs. Uh, he works in the tech industry; has a little more money than me. I spent fifty bucks. Um, and then the third version of Wasteland is coming out. It's, it's where Fallout came from. It was Interplay yeah, okay. wanted to keep making Fallout games, but they didn't have the rights. Anyway, the point of this is that it came with a book that it would say, "Read Passage Forty Five. And so you had a huge book that had all these mm. passages, and you would flip to 45 and read it. I love that. They yeah. recently released a version of the original one where you no longer have to do that, where it, like, I think it automatically brings it up, saying this is what the entry read. And I was like, no, 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 no. I like turning my vision from the computer to another place to add a little bit of... Uh, it just adds to my frustration that writing has taken such a backseat when it comes to game design and development. Um, and there's, and that has, it has very little, you well, know, I guess it does have something to do with affinity for Ultima 4 and company, but um, reading a, like a develop, reading over a development cycle and writing always comes last. You know, everything else is like this. And you can tell uh, how, how many games plot, characterization, narrative are actually memorable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there are some, I think for, what's weird, makes it even more frustrating, is that they keep trying to add narrative in the forms of these awful quests. 
Mm-hmm. Well, exposition through. You do this procedure. Come back, collect reward. Right. It's not really a, not really writing. Um, well, uh, the better question is how many. I mean, you, you know, obviously the the progen- you know, the archetype of that is how World of Warcraft does that. You know, constantly, but it's building lore. But I always, you know, my wife who has played more than her share of World of Warcraft, you know, has never read a quest log at all you know she quickly just mm. finds out what you need to do yeah. and goes meanwhile yeah. this is why she and i don't well we will play together from time to time but i will drive her crazy because i'm going to sit there and i'm gonna f- and i want to know the relationships between the two characters yeah. and these fetch quests and she's like why are you doing that well then i gotta ask is it worth it are the is there anything that you as someone who also even through something like final fantasy will just go through like <laughs> just keep hitting a and I can't, because it's just unbearable at times. I mean, do you find it worth even critiquing? In World of Warcraft, I do. And I would actually say the level, it's the most comic booky fiction you can possibly, but I get fascinated by the World of Warcraft lore. I really, I truly do. Because I love, I mean, this is just, you know, this is, again, this is a bigger conversation. I love how they have boiled down sometimes, not this a high fantasy world. It's like high fantasy meets... Warner Brothers cartoons. I don't even know how to explain it, but but the level of the narrative in some ways that's extremely compelling to me. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it's it's not essential to the game at all, mm-hmm. right? And how many people? But what's funny is I do read all that stuff, but there are people that are obviously much who played. I haven't played that much World of Warcraft compared to people that play the end games over and over, and there are people that get absolutely obsessed by the by the lore, you know. Um, I mean, if you remember the, you know, the the event that happened recently with the burning of the world tree, I don't even know if I'm getting the name of that right, but that happened in the lore of the game, and people went absolutely ape shit. You know, like they, mm-hmm. you know, Twitter was just, how can you do this? Because it was a it was a heel turn for, for the Sylvanas Windrunner, the 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 leader of the horde. And by by the way, I only know this stuff from reading it from off of columns. I know only the basics of these characters because uh, even even reading it from the lore of the fetch quest, you still. Unless you really are playing a lot, it's still to get the larger pictures. It's hard. It's one of the things that's always frustrated me with about World of Warcraft is that I, I'm always confused as to how people can get so invested in the major lore because the amount of time that it takes to do that is so large. Yeah. Um, maybe because I'm spending so much time reading about you know some farmer who just wants me to collect five apples all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're reading. We read the book of history. We've got your Ankh. Let's still clutching this Greek artifact. The writes unbidden and climb the slope. So now this is interesting. You know, when I'm talking about portals before, I, I'm talking about it as though there's this assumption that you're going to go through it. I completely forgot that you don't even go through the stinking portal. Not this one. I, well, how do we get in? We fall asleep, I think, later. You can't, as you go over the hill and there's the fair. Yeah, but something happens after we do the. Okay. We're, we're gonna do the reading soon. So here's here's the here's the Ren Fair. I love this scene. People in Milwaukee find Ren Fairs cool. I've never been. I went one that was like 15 years old. My wife wants to go so bad, but uh, yeah, I won't get into my criticisms of LARP. It. it it prices me out. And when I think about it, if I go, hmm, if I'm going to spend $40 on this, I'm just going to go down the road and go to Great America right. and hop on a roller coaster or something stupid. Um, I don't know. I feel like I have LARPers in my family, and I love them dearly, and it's I've never derided that pastime. Um, because Lord knows I've never been far from it myself, I guess. But um, man, there's you want to talk about diegetic and non diegetic <laughs> spaces. Wow. Um, there was a big, when I was in high school, there was a big Society for Creative Anachronism um, chapter. Hmm. And it was always just a little much for me. Yeah, but maybe that was my own issues with coming to terms with geekdom. Yeah, there's something about it when a subculture bubbles up 
into that I don't uh, I don't want to use this word I can't think of anything else the normal space you know you know it's like I don't I, we don't like it when and this is Gamergate we don't want you and I'm what I'm saying when I when I say normal I mean my perspective mm -hmm. of you know person X's perspective of their bubble right, right. when you have a you have female gamers busting into your domain um, there's this is a thing I think there's something about geek culture that is specifically prone to territorialism well we talked a lot a little bit earlier about how spaces and these things offer we use the term safe to navigate uh, is it one people that we you know, people invade those safe spaces that yeah. don't necessarily share our perspectives, then it becomes threatened. So maybe mm -hmm. it's not as I don't. It, that's me just throwing out an idea there. Well, there's a purist. Um, you know, there's this kind of. I mean, I liken it to white nationalism. Right. Right. There's a puritanical kind of. Um, I, I I don't like Anastasia Salter, and many many others get into this in much better ways than mm -hmm. I ever ever could but I think there's something where that about geek culture that makes us particularly privy especially if we're never checked <laughs> you know right those of us lucky enough who have met with who have been said no you know no this is not how things work you know we've we've kind of kind of put a lot of this behind but for for a great many people who for the, the the world on screen is a much safer, much more pleasurable place. This could be a problem mm -hmm. where you're able. Like I can talk about your mother all day long. There's nothing you can do. There are no ramifications other than right. in a ban. Right. I don't know. If that's no. I think it makes sense. Well, I mean, I was I I signed the novel Ready Player One to my class. Um, and one of the criticisms of that novel, which, by the way, I love, and I'm realizing that I'm the only one who likes that book, um, is that one of the criticisms of the book is that it's a celebration of gatekeeping, and that's kind of what we're talking about is right. We have to keep the gates of geekdom safe. Um, that it seems that people that control geekdom or, or you know what is cool, what isn't in those areas, you know, to be labeled a poser in those societies, seems to be extremely virulent. Again, the gamer gate. Yeah, you know, this was a space for. Although I've always found Gamergate so f absolutely freaking absurd, because when I grew up, um, all the geeking community, the geeking, <laughs> the geek <laughs> communities that I grew up in were extremely inclusive. Yeah. Um, you know, I. Well, so I've always found it strange that all of a sudden it's become male dominated. Because when I was a kid, if you, it, I mean, it was larger. There weren't there weren't so many outlets. But if you played D and D, you were probably the same person that was listening to, um, you know. I was going to use Rush, which is the easy one to go with. Or, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the most that. inclusive <laughs> musical fandom <laughs> ever. <laughs> Did you ever see that comparison of the women's bath, the line to the women's bathroom to the men's? No. Have you ever been to a Rush show? No. Uh, you will get in. You will have most. I've been to a, a few, and you'll never have a problem going into the women's room. The men's room. Uh, this funny. is a stark contrast to really? anything else. You will be waiting, and there will usually be a kind, a woman kind enough to be standing by the door, going, "It's empty, go on <laughs> in," and they just watch it. It's a, it's wonderful. Um, I don't know. I think because we were in bubbles, though. I agree with that. I agree with that. Like I say, I felt like it was inclusive. Yeah. But then at the same time, you know, my geek community. But again, I mean, I lived in I lived, you know, my, when I was 16 years old, I was in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, the diversity of Bellevue West High School in Omaha, Nebraska, was not particularly large. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we had, you know, I, I don't know. But I, but I mean, I will say that. Anyway, that's a long, that's my, a longer issue. It's my D and D group was all guys. Yeah. I mean, and I that's. That's something that that's one reason why I play female characters, mm -hmm. just because as as a nod to that deficiency. Uh, still, uh, but I my mean... grandmother owned a Nintendo, <laughs> you know. More my babysitters, um, almost all female, had they were the ones that had the video game consoles. I did not. Hmm. Um, 
So it's always I've always associated video game playing with really feminine. Yeah, that's it. That's really interesting. And so it's kind of a shocker to go through and go. I mean, well, like a um, Roberta King's Williams. Quest, Roberta, Roberta Williams. Williams. Yeah. She was like my. I loved her. I had no idea who she was, but she, that's who represented game development to me. That's a, yeah. I mean, she's certainly a big name. Um, but that was the only name I, I knew because those he, are the games I played. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also because, you know, King's Quest put their... Sierra Online was putting the names of their authors on the boxes, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, Infocom, all male, except for... Oh, I think the last name is Briggs. Um, Amy like... Briggs, I believe is the name. Um, who wrote Plundered Hearts, which is a... Am I right? If you look at Plundered Did Hearts, she... Infocom... Um, but that's that's like it that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, Plundered Hearts, you got Savers. it. Nice I have work. beaten Plundered Hearts. It is a good game. It is a romance, inf- interactive fiction text adventure worth playing. And wasn't John Romero's wife the yeah. developer for Wizardry? Brenda Brath- Bathwaite, if I'm getting it correctly. Brenda Romero, I think she goes by now. Yeah, I mean, there's... she helped. She worked on the later Wizardries. The original okay. Wizardry would be Robert Woodhead and okay. Andrew Greenberg, is that right? Something like that. Anyway. Yeah, I know. So it's. I still think there would be exceptions. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> My goal is to just at least get through the character <laughs> creation by the end. Of, I'll be happy with that. This is no ordinary traveling carnival. But Does traveling have two L's in it? I don't know. Two English majors in the. Yep, two two L's according to uh, Google's. I'm on three hours of sleep. Whew, kids still not sleeping through that. Long story. (laughs) Tenants on the tent tops, boat race. Ticket taker. Another portal. Gatekeeping. There's something to be said for the uncanniness of these graphics. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, going back to Shakespeare, there's something, you know, the the, the jester, the fool, um, I'm, and who, who is a prominent yeah. role in all of these games. Uh, f- closely affiliated with the wilderness, uh, one thing that Garriott doesn't seem to go into is the um, non-binary, or the gender play that goes on with the fool. So I'm going to have to ask them to take a two-minute break. All right. I'll be right back. I keep drinking this bottle of water. <laughs> Three seconds. I know we're only 30 minutes, but I couldn't make it. Mm-hmm. Taking this moment to answer a few emails. Fun stuff.
So one of the things that oh doors unlocked. Nice. Sorry about that. Oh, no sweat. Uh, <laughs> keep forgetting. One of the things that uh, we've opted for is to have the camera off and realize that you don't have this feeling that you're being watched. So I, like, as soon as you left, I started looking at emails, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, wait, I'm still doing this. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, let's see. This is kind of long. This is always a little bit longer. Last time, couple of times you've played through this, it's like this is longer than I remember. Probably because I was just tapping through. Is the mic muted? No. No. Okay. No. Does it always have that red light? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when it's okay. muted, it'll it'll start blinking. Always a gypsy. Always a female gypsy too. There's a constant narrative trope, um, and I imagine it's problematic on some levels. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about gypsy culture. Spent a little time in Romania. Um, where you gypsy, did? Yeah. Oh. Uh, where the gypsy culture is called Roma, and the extreme levels of um, prejudice against the Roma communities. Mm. Um, but again, I don't know much about gypsy stuff. I know that they often show up in works like this to be used as, a, you know, the archetype of the mysterious stranger, um, you know, given these kind of supernatural this, uh, ability to communicate with the supernatural. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't speak to it either. I mean, it's uh, overused. Uh, I'm... In my fifth edition game, Curse of Strahd, um, and it's a whole, I believe this, it is a holdover from the original uh, Ravenloft module for Dungeons and Dragons. The part, one of the, ran, there's a randomizing element to the game where you meet a gypsy and she gives you a reading. There's special cards um, that you could make when you played Ravenloft back in the 80s, but now, um, yeah, I think it comes with the actual, the module. Hmm. And you give readings, and it's a, a gypsy woman who is in league, or not in league, she's, it doesn't matter, but lives in this alternate realm but again the the readings that you get um actually change the world of the Crystal Strahd game they reveal where hmm. certain magic items are held and actually they also determine where uh Strahd himself will be when you need to eventually battle him oh. but it's the same exact same thing that we have these gypsies that um are foretelling the future We're getting into the... Don't ever part with your onk. I lost my onk. The one that I had that came with Ultima 4. But I have a new one. The trout, so I guess I'm alright. Nice. You have been waiting such a long time, but at last you have come. Sit here and I shall read the path of your future. Alright. The moment of truth. This is where I, I feel. Interesting that there's a little timing here too. Yeah. A little uh, suspense. That is. That's actually kind of. That's that's a small little feature I like. Okay. Now I am gonna. Uh, no, so you say from these choices you always end up becoming a tinker? I believe so. Or no. Tinker or shepherd, it's always the one that sounds the least heroic. And maybe that's the only... I wonder if that's the only two choices. Like, that's... Because last time we did nothing but what seemed closely aligned with a paladin, and that's what we ended up getting. Well, like I said, I, I think we should answer these as... Uh... We can see what we would both vote for. As much as... I think we should play it as, as if we were ourselves. All right. In the I, theory of... 
Richard Garriott. I would do compassion. Um, we haven't gotten the we haven't gotten the uh, question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing. I just, I just assume. Which means, yeah. Well, I mean, that, and that's how I answer these questions. You know, it's like I didn't even look at the. I would say, okay, well, what would I do in this situation? Yeah, I would take compassion. Well, I, see, I never find that valiant to kill him. Like, somehow it's valiant to take someone out. Yeah. As expected of a valiant duelist. Well, I mean, there's this... Like, moving through this, it would be interesting to see how code and structure is deployed through these cards. So it's interesting that Garriott and whoever's work, you know, making develop this game, there's a there's a tension between these two. Um, do you think that I mean do you think the tension between well are you um, I mean I know this is a ranking system, right? The whole idea here is for us to try to for a hit to have some idea of where we'd rank each of these virtues, right? Does this? I mean, the thing too. The gypsy says this is going to be our future. I don't know if this is going to do anything other than decide what type of character we're playing. Yeah. Well, hey. Sacrifice and honor. a bounty hunter dog the bounty hunter sworn to return him an alleged murder I would go with sacrifice yeah I, I, I have a feeling that we're both heading towards um, sheep herding <laughs> With a with a quickness. Have you ever played any of the Dragon Quest games? I played the first one. I was, oh no, um, I was thinking of Dragon Age. No, I've not played Dragon Quest. <laughs> you can one of the jobs that you can choose, and jobs is kind of like classes in the games. I understand it is to be a shepherd, and uh, that comes with an entire outfit that makes you look like a sheep. <laughs> I should show you a picture of it. It's rather amazing. <laughs> Despite the fact you wouldn't think you would want to play Shepard until you, once you see that outfit, you're like, no, I, 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 I could wear that for the rest of the game. Virtue resides in all people. A rogue steal from thy lord. I would uh, probably call him to justice. All right. All right. Halfway through. Honesty and humility. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I would go with B. I'll let the I'll let the king get his due. <laughs> no, it wasn't you that killed it. It was It reminds me of my favorite sequences in one of my favorite fantasy films, Dragon Slayer. Mm. That's an old one. That's a great one. See, this one's tough. I mean, I, I would go with B because I guess I save more people that way. I feel like Gary, I may have labored long to come up with a way to show a difference between compassion and sacrifice, and I'm not sure he succeeded here. Yeah, that's a weird one because you stop in compassion to aid a wounded companion. Couldn't you also stop, you know, turn in compassion to slow the pursuing enemy? Like, I mean, if you get down to. See, that's where that simulation comes in. Who am I saving more of? Right. Well, and sacrifice myself. Is, um, um, aren't I also saving my wounded companion there? Yeah. 
So parsing this quickly as I can, I would say B, All right. just because it sounds like I save more people that way. I'll defer to that. Because I'm too lazy to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Justice and humility. And these questions are different, because once it gets an idea, I believe... Because once it gets an idea of what you're ranking, it then says, okay, I know that he value or she values justice, but I don't know, but also humility. Now I've got to figure out which one is going to be tops. Unwitnessed, thou hast slain a great dragon in self defense. A poor warrior claims the offered reward. Oh, yeah, he can have it. B? Yeah. A lot of people taking claim for our dragon kills today. Kind of jotting this down. I don't have any particular reason why. So you're thinking that this isn't as random as I. No, no, no. I, I, I think it, it. Once you've chosen one, it says, "Okay, I'm going to place that one high." And now, but I don't. But and then, so say I choose sacrifice in round one, and then I chose humility in round two. Now it has to put sacrifice and humility together for it to know which one I'm going to put above. What about the beads? Does that I'll play it again? If we, if we I can play it again in my own downstairs and see if it's different. If I choose different things, it's a good question. I don't think it is, but I don't know. The beads are I, like I don't really pay attention to them, but it doesn't seem any to be any rhyme or reason. What? Dodge that. Donate all thy wealth to feed hundreds of starving children and receive public adulation. Or humbly live out thy life. Am I not going to live? On the f that's, yeah, I don't know. That's a, that... See, I'm going to take B and we're going to end up being a shepherd. Just because maybe because I do have kids. Well, A is kind of gross. The public adulation. Oh, it's the <laughs> public <laughs> adulation. Yeah, let's go with B. <laughs> With the final choice, the incense swells up around you. The gypsy speaks as if from a great distance, her voice growing fainter with each word. So be it, thy path is chosen. Oh, look at you. I've never noticed. Is that a little sheep in the humility card? Yeah. Uh, I assume so. It looks kind of like it a... It looks like a white duck. Well, yeah, it looks like... <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a duck puppy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I never noticed that there's a creature about to eat us in sacrifice. Oh, yeah. I yeah. never noticed that. It looks like a giant capybara. Well, that's what's interesting about the sword. You know, that's this kind of like the sword just kind of sitting there and you're... I will help you up and not fight this thing. All right. There's a moment of intense wrenching vertigo. She opened your eyes. Seek the counsel of thy sovereign. So we are given a little bit of instruction. Open Being your eyes. a freaking shepherd. Two... Through the threshold. So, ah. we don't go through a portal. We don't fall asleep. Mm -mm. It's incense. <laughs> the end, we just suddenly in a cloud, and then we're here. Okay. No, hit Z, and then once here we are. Shepherd. <laughs> so, it... Out of that, there uh, the humility card came up three times, and we kept choosing it, didn't we? Sacrifice came up twice. Um, See, I think that's what it's doing. It's not ranking them one to eight. It's trying to find the one that you prize among all the others. Yeah, sacrifice came up twice. Compassion came up twice. Valor once. Honor once. Spirituality once. Oh damn. What are you looking for? Pause. Oh. Oh, because I'm... Is it escape? Nope. That would be no. Am I right next to a dungeon there? Oh, Majinsky. No, that should, be, oh. that should be the first town. Is there no pause? I'm going to die right away. Oh, that's, that's right. I'm going to get poisoned. Oh, this is my favorite town, though. I haven't. I should... I'm just trying to see if there's a... So your shepherd is... We have a female shepherd, Abshai. What is G? Do you know what the G stands for? Gold. 
gold. Food and gold. Weapon armor. No, uh, the G in the upper right oh. corner. You got me. No magic. <laughs> All right, so do we know what time we're in? I should have picked Valor. Uh, we're in Magentia. Um, this is the town inhabited by spirits and uh, devils, apparently. Yeah, I just read the history, uh, thanks to Kyle the Younger, and uh, it said that this was a... I don't think I was here the last time I played Ultima 4. Maybe it wasn't a shadow. Maybe it was a tinker. I don't remember being here. I think this is... Is this the town... So a couple of concerns I have about as we play this, which is, if one, there's evidently a puzzle near... Uh, a riddle near the end of this game that uh, you never really get the answer for, so it probably won't be cheating for us to cheat. Um, that was, like, kind of a minor bug. But look at that ghost. I don't ever remember being here, but there's also a town that you have to f the only way to get to it is if, is if you like take over a pirate ship to get to it um, and I'm wondering if that's Magencia. and that's the sunken uh, there's like a there's a town that is this the same town that is uh, was afflicted by pride yeah I believe Curse so that would make pride. sense because that's why we're starting out here a little... in a land devoted to humility alright so you know what I'm going to do? I think I'll upload my notes every time we do this. So, Humagility. So, every one of these towns, uh, again, I can't not remember the things I do know about this game, which is that every one of the major towns is associated with one of the virtues. Yep. Um, and I think in each of those towns, so again, this is a knowledge just from playing the game in the past that I can't, I can't forget. I believe you need to get the mantra, so a special mantra for each, mm -hmm. uh, each virtue, which you will then recite at an altar. So, it means you need to find out what the mantra is, and you also need to find out where is the altar? Mm -hmm. Do you have to get a stone too? So I'm, I want to list the NPC. So Virtue Bane. So which you is interesting. So proud he's... city of the high seas. So I'm pretty sure that this is the city that was decimated due to its pride and hubris. Yes. Let's go ahead. Here we go. I... Yeah, hang on one second. I want to. Uh, for those who just joined us, this is Classic Quest. Um, we are wrapping up our second session for this semester. Um, got through character creation by the skin of our teeth. Uh, we're here, landed in Magencia, and we are starting the starting the quest. Um, our attempt in this playthrough will be to kind of rehash what the anticipated experience was for Ultima 4 when it came back, came out um, decades ago. Here's what uh, the history of Britannia tells us about Magencia. Somewhere out beyond civilization is also reputed to lie the ruins of the legendary town of Magencia, which the gods destroyed for the insufferable pride of those that dwelt there. All of the magnificent marble palaces and gardens were devastated, and the rich, haughty, Inhabitants reduced to haunting spirits. No one has ever confirmed this legend, so it may just be a fable to frighten the weak of heart and instill humility in those that overvalue their own worth. Sounds how are we gonna, how do we show humility in this game? I guess we don't brag. Um, so what's his job? Yeah. That's he's a welcomer. Yeah. What does he say? About, how about Magencia? Magencia fell into the realm of darkness for the city. Yeah, got that. Now this is a tough question. If we say no, does that sound like we are? I'm gonna have to. I think for the sake of finishing this game, we have to say no. Yeah. Ah. Say, right, right in pride. Humility. Sorry, I don't need to tell you what no, you're fine. And, and mantra. But this is how things worked. Yeah. I mean, if you played this game with some, I mean, I, my, uh, I had a friend when I first played this. I, I went, would go to a friend's house after school and we would play this, and this is exactly what I would do: sit on the side, 
with the books and kind of figure things out. Try mantra. <laughs> huh. How's his health? <laughs> and uh, just for giggles and poops, and I know he's going to say, ask him to join. Proud of that little steed's lusty need to fall from the light. <coughs> yeah, I would try pride and humility. I tried pride, humility, and mantra. Huh. What was that? Spirits? That was an interesting uh, like, little deeds. To raise our humility, I guess we're not supposed to brag. It's I mean what are little deeds in a computer game? Don't they all, don't they all have some type of <laughs> presumed importance? I mean I, I ran into this last time I was playing I was like okay I mean, I was able to like raise a few of my virtues up you know like the sacrifice one you can give away all your gold to like beggars that kind of makes sense mm -hmm. but humility how often am I I guess we have to We'll just have to be careful throughout the game that we don't start bragging, which I don't yeah. think sounds too hard. I will confess right now, I tend to get impatient. Like, or I will fall into. So if I'm going too fast. No, no, it's fine. Please say so. Especially with when it comes to, like, inputting these types of things. See, here's the right. Trick. So I mean, I to me the answer would be no. That's a take no pride. So there we go. I think we did the right thing, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm writing these down. Take no pride in humility, lest ye destroy it. Right. Or some of the other ones. Yeah, pride, humility, a terrible thing. Humility and then humility and then mantra. Do you have oh, a lit and shrine? Ooh, nice. Because you have to find out where the shrine is. Too. Did you say stone too? I vaguely remember that there's something about a stone. I don't. I can't remember if I'm right on that. Oh, where ghostly go? Oh. Attacked by a python. So this place is actually overrun by uh, monsters. Well, if you do that, we lose valor. Oh. Tough. It's up to seven. It's not that big. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. We're, that's great. I don't know why. If you let it flee, you get compassion. We are going to be dead soon. He's answering your question of health. Oh, see, I was I was asking him to heal me. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so. Um, sound.
guess. Yeah. Maybe they'll tell you the shrine. The rune. That's, that's what you, the rune. The rune. Ask. Ask the... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hold on. Let me write that down. Ask the snake of the rune. At least you didn't kill it. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. I thought it ran away. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, is that true? Run, run down and see. I'll probably make like it. But you know what? The last thing I want to do is put us in a state where we can't win the game because we killed them. Well, it's uh, five to three. <laughs> I'm about to take my last step in Majincia. It was a nice visit. Interesting that it speaks um, in the first person. It doesn't say you feel motion or you feel dark. So it looks like we lose possessions when we die, but that's not too bad. It's not mostly, I and mean, we didn't have much to begin with. Mm -hmm. We have five points of experience. Again, my concern here is if we killed that python if we were to continue playing with this game state, it's possible that we wouldn't be able to solve the game. I don't know that for sure. I would be willing to look that up, and if that is true, I would... We'd start again. I would... I, we're not too far, so it's not a big deal. No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think maybe off stream. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> for the sake of moving forward. Uh, or else we will be getting to the end around 2072. Yeah. Um, well. Should we end here? Yeah. We'll pick it up next week. We'll have a new character maybe. and uh, Or we'll have the same one. So I guess you or you'll never know because it'll still be named Abshai. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think you want to hit it towards the Q, which is uh, quit and save. You have to be outside of the building. There was a, one of the fun things about these games when you're is looking for the yeah. It's like a testament to your your memory if you can. It's like oh, that's a secret door. As I get older, my uh, spatial recognition skills go down so quickly. Like I remember playing Doom. And being able to remember how a level's laid out now in my 40s, I just have to like keep bopping around until I find, yeah, the way out is east and the south. But evidently, I remember this way out. Hmm, I thought I would talk to you. Um, Alright, so I'm heading out. Save. Yeah, we should. How do you? How that, do you... That's it. I mean, I had, a, I had a DOS box. I think you probably hit the Windows button. Oh, okay. And then just close it up. All right.